Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Mountain Minds Monday. It's a production of Tahoe Silicon Mountain here in Truckee, California. And we have a great crowd in the audience tonight, and I believe we are being live streamed, so I'm going to uh, cover off a few things before we get started. Uh, first of all, my name is Ted Parkhill. I work at Incline Investment Management in Incline. We also um, have Incline Investment Advisories for those that uh, need to have their finances taken care of. Um, I'm here tonight uh, as a fill-in because normally the founder of Tahoe Silicon Mountain, Johannes Ziegler, would be here and making the announcement, so I'm actually the fill-in. And so hopefully I survive the evening uh, unscarred. But J Johannes, uh, to his credit, has started the event has run it for a number of years, and he would normally be here, but he has a really good excuse. He's actually in Germany. So I, I would just like to have a shout out to, to Johannes for doing such a fantastic job and getting this thing going and keeping it going all these years. So cheers to Johannes. I'd also like to welcome all the newcomers tonight. In our introductory uh, piece earlier, when we were doing a little bit of networking, I noticed there were a number of folks here for the first time, even the second time. So welcome to you all, and particularly to Jordan, who uh, counts us all as friends, which I think is fantastic. He clearly is a lot like me and is probably not on Facebook because the prerequisite for Facebook is you need friends. So perhaps there's hope yet, Jordan. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to um, Josh Miller, who's going to say a few words about our sponsors. Thanks, Ted. Um, so uh, we want to give thanks to all of our sponsors that make nights like tonight possible. Uh, we have Holland and Hart is a local sponsor. Uh, Dick Schultze here is a partner at uh, Holland and Hart, specializing in IP law and various other, uh, virtually all, all types of law. Um, Mobo, Mobo Law, Mo, Mo, uh, Rich Molesby is part of TSM, he's not here tonight, uh, another law firm here local in Truckee. Um, New Leaders, New Leaders does web and um, mobile design and development, so if you have a tech company and need uh, assistance with some design or development services, New Leaders can help you with that, and they're uh, in Reno and have people locally here in Truckee as well. And Mountain Workspace. Mountain Workspace is a co-working space uh, just opened up in Incline Village uh, last month. Really cool space. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out next time you're in Incline. Um, and then our community partners, uh, Truckee, Truckee Chamber of Commerce, uh, Truckee Tahoe Community T Television, which is helping us with broadcasting tonight to anyone that is out in the other room or isn't able to be physically present um, for the meeting tonight. Uh, the Lyft Coworking, a co-working space uh, that Jan uh, is managing um, next to the Truckee, uh, uh, Truckee Airport, and Pete's on the Hill, which is where we're located and what we're having for dinner tonight. So those are our sponsors. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Josh. Uh, just to mention that Josh is the sponsor coordinator for TSM. So thank you, Josh, for uh, recognizing everyone that supports us. I'd also like to mention there are a number of individual sponsors in, pre uh, in attendance tonight. So thank you as well for your ongoing support. Um, just a couple of announcements that are officially I'd like to cover off right quickly right now is that uh, just reminding, and for those of you that are watching on, on TV, uh, volunteers are free to attend the, uh, the Mountain Minds Monday event. Um, if you commit to one year with TSM, you get a, a, a fancy name tag. And there are a number of examples being demonstrated here, clearly by um, Carol Merrill over here on the, oh no, I mean, that's Rachel. Um, and so, thank you, Rachel. Uh, the other thing is that, as many of you know in the audience, local high school students are free with ID. Um, we are, encourage your friends to come, and, and thanks to all that, that have arrived tonight. And just to reiterate, uh, we have uh, Mr. Craig Rowe from, uh, from Truckee High, who is an English teacher there and has encouraged a number of his students to attend tonight. So thank you very much for coordinating that. We appreciate it. Um, there is a new payment model for, uh, and, and uh, in, in effect these days. It's pay what you can. So we really encourage you to pay as much as you can, of course, for every time you come tonight. Uh, I think the average cost is just over $15. So that's sort of the going rate. If you can swing that, fantastic. If not, it's okay. We welcome everyone. So do come and pay as much as you can. Um, and now with that, I'd like to turn it over to Rachel with uh, a special announcement. Hi, we just have a, one last quick announcement before we get started, and I think Ellen mentioned it already, but we're going to be having another startup weekend up here in Truckee. So our last one was actually in 2014, so it's about time. We don't have a firm date set, but it's either going to be in May or June, 
and the most important thing we need right now is volunteers whether it be for the day of the event um, whether it be helping organize uh, someone especially to do finances and so you can just come up and talk to me and let me know if you're interested it takes uh, a lot of people to put on uh, such a big event so we definitely encourage you all to come and come and help Thanks, Rachel. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to get involved in those startup weekends. They're a ton of fun, and some really good things come from them. And they're really popular up here. And so if you know anybody that's interested, you don't have to have an idea. It's great if you do. But you can um, just come and participate, and you'll get involved and, and find a team and, and lend a hand as to what skills you might have. Somebody might pick you up, and you'll just learn a ton. It's a lot of fun. So tonight we have a very special guest and is our speaker and I'm just going to say a couple of words um, in brief introduction of um, Maria Tran. And Maria is the co-founder of the Sea of Solidarity, which I have no idea what that is. I, I even looked it up and I went, wow, this is really cool. I'm really looking forward to this. Hopefully she can tell us what that means. Uh, Maria was a former product manager in Silicon Valley. That sounds really thrilling. So I think she saw the light and decided to pursue other interests. She currently lives in Truckee, uh, running a nonprofit and working on various passion projects. And I like the sounds of that, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from her. Tonight's presentation is entitled, Running a Global Nonprofit from a Mountain Town. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Maria. Thank you for coming. issues yeah. are we good okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> well thank you everyone for having me here tonight it is an honor to come here and talk to my community and share with you what I have been doing for the last two and a half years of my life um, so I've lived in Truckee full-time for the last two and a half years prior to that I ski leased just up the street here in Tahoe Donner for about seven years and uh, prior to coming to Truckee, I was a product manager, mostly doing software products. And my last job was at a company that some of you might have heard of. It's called Facebook. <laughs> and I was building text analytics at Facebook. And it was actually at Facebook while I was looking at my news feed that um, situations just changed my life and how I got involved in helping with the European crisis and how I ended up co-founding um, CF Solidarity and you guys will learn all about it and especially you Ted because I'll give you a special test for that <laughs> so according to UNHCR the organization that's in charge of monitoring refugees and migration there were a million refugees who left Turkey and North Africa to try to make it to Europe in 2015. Just to bring you guys back to what was happening then, that was the summer when we started seeing photos in newspapers like New York Times with people on boats coming and landing in the shores of Greece. All of that was happening so far away, and I think like most Americans, it was so easy to dismiss for myself. Um, it was completely easy to dismiss that there were a million people trying to find safety. And in some of those numbers, it's really terrifying. There were 3,700 people who died drowning that year trying to come to Europe. And one third of those were children. And like I said, for me, like for most Americans, all these headlines, we saw them in the summer, but it was easy to dismiss. And that was until I saw this photo. How many of you remember seeing this photo? Pretty much almost everyone, right? And this photo is universally horrifying. But for me, it touched a very, very personal place. Because I was also three when my parents had to make the very, very difficult decision to sell every single thing that they owned, to leave their family and their friends, to get on a boat to leave. And they had to do that because we were ethnic Chinese. 
And along with about 800,000 other ethnic Chinese people, we were living in Vietnam and making a life in Vietnam, and for some of us, for multiple generations. But what the Western um, world didn't know, and especially after the US involvement with the Vietnam War, everyone just wanted to you know, get back to normality. Um, but what was happening in Vietnam at that time, after the communists took over, is very similar to what we're seeing happening in Myanmar right now with the Rohingyas. Ethnic Chinese people were being harassed and run out of our homes and out of our business during that time. And many, for some of you who are old enough in this group, to remember the boat people that happened then, many of those boat people were ethnic Chinese people. And some of those boat people were my people. <laughs> and so when I saw that picture of Elon Curdy, I wasn't able to just look away. I wasn't able to dismiss it. And it really rocked me to the core. I was working at Facebook at the time, and I just, I knew that I had to do something. I knew I had to go and learn what was happening because this, the photo of Elon Curdy, unlike any other thing that happened, humanized the situation of what was happening. It brought it to a level that everyone could understand. And I wanted to go and see and learn to figure out what was really going on, not just what people were writing about so that I can tell the story, and really so that I can learn more about myself and what my family um, had to go through too to make such a difficult decision. Um, so, but you know, I'm here today, and we were lucky. I wasn't Elon Curdy. After three days of being on a boat in the sea, my family was rescued. We were pulled in by the, post, by the Coast Guard off the coast of Hong Kong, and we were able to live in a refugee camp for six months until an American family from Oregon adopted us and brought us over. And that's why I'm here today. And so everything that I have and everything that I am today, I owe to other people helping me. And that's really why I'm here, to talk about my experiences. And so two weeks after seeing that photo of Elon Curdy, I kept on talking about wanting to go. But I really was not equipped to go and help out, right? I didn't speak Arabic. I had no idea what was going on. But luckily enough, I was able to find a person by the name of Medj Tebby, who was a former Facebooker. And we had a mutual friend. And he was Syrian-American. And he wanted to go and to document what was happening to his people, why they were leaving, and to tell their stories. So I tagged along with Medj and his photographer friend, Sarah. And we went to this island called Lesvos. And Tony, you've been over to, um, to Turkey. You know where the islands are. Many people don't know this, but there is a set of disputed islands that have been disputed for like hundreds of years between Turkey and Greece that are literally right off of Turkey's border. And Lesbos is one of the biggest hot spots during the refugee crisis. At the height of the crisis, over 3,000 people were making their way every single day to come to Lesbos. And this is only five miles off of the Turkish coast. And so, I went to Lesbos, and I want to share with you um, what I've learned and how that experience really um, energized me and got me into doing what I'm doing now, which is running a nonprofit. Um, many of you have seen photos of beach landings. This is a video recording um, from my co-founder at Sea of Solidarity. I don't know if we can get the, the sound for this, but... Um, I wanted you to see the video so that you can get a sense for just how chaotic a, a boat landing really is. Um, you can see that there are 50, 60 people jammed into this particular boat. And this boat is just a rubber dinghy, you know, something that you would take rafting down, you know, like the Colorado or even the Truckee. And underneath this, it's literally one sheet of plywood. And all 50 or 60 people are in this. And Adam has a GoPro. This is Adam's voice, and he's saying, slow down, be careful. And you can see that they're passing the children. They usually put women and children in the center, and what they don't realize is that in the center is where people get crushed, and it's also where the water fills up. And so that's where we get most of the trampled and injured kids and women, and where we get hypothermic kids. 
And so in this video, it'll happen later, there's a woman in there trapped and she can't get out because she can't move. Her legs were trampled, right? And, and sometimes this journey can take hours depending on the sea conditions. And so Adam comes in and he starts lifting her up and bringing her to the shore. So this is where that part of it happens. So. It only came in straight. Okay, okay. Uh, watch out, watch out. Oh gosh. Her legs broke her legs hurt. Yep. Uh, oh no. To, to where? Oh no no. Hello? Her leg is hurt bad. No, should I sit her down somewhere? So that particular landing, now picture that, 40, 50 times a day, every single day from that summer okay. all the way through that winter of 2015 and 2016. And I landed at this beach, you know, from research that I was doing off of Facebook to find out where I should go. And within 15 minutes of just coming onto the beach where I was told that people would land and boats would land, it was chaos. Boat after boat after boat came in. And I didn't even have time to think. And I started just doing things that needed to get done. And most of those things were working a tea and soup station. Right here, you can see me doing that. Um, and passing out tea and soup for people. And then also helping with women and children. So as the children get passed down, most of the children are wet because they've been in this boat. And they're cold and they're hungry. And so what we did was change the children out, put the mylar blankets on them, and gave them food, whatever food that we had. And three out of the five days that I was actually on Lesvos, it was some of the most horrifying um, things that I've ever seen and terrible, terrible weather. You know how when we get weather here and it's too uh, warm to snow, but it's still really, really cold, like 30s, 40 degree weather and wet and with that piercing wind? People don't think about that when they think about Greece, but that's what I witnessed. And so these photos were taken by a Getty photographer that I met when I was there. Her name is Paula Bronstein. And the photo to the, your left um, is of the families that night, the night that I was out there working, who were piled into this tent to try to stay warm because there were no buses that were going to be able to take them to the registration center. You can just see the mass of humanity of people who are just piled up out inside the tent. And the picture over on this side, they're the people outside of the tent. You can see the white tent in the background. And so the little hotel that I was staying in was just down the street from these. And that, I have to say, was one of the most terrible nights that I've ever had, trying to get into my bed um, and trying to sleep as I heard noises and sounds from these people who were outside in the cold. And we weren't able to let people in because it was against the law at that time in Greece to help any migrants who weren't registered yet. And it was just a terrible, terrible thing to have to sit through. And um, it's something that I still have nightmares about today. So at the point in October 2015, after these people get registered, they go to a place called Moria. I cannot even make this up. Tolstoy fans, yes. They go to a place called Moria. And Moria used to be a Greek prison on Lesbos. So you can see like the, the, the um, fencing and, and the barbed wire. People at that time, because there were so many people every single day, they were standing in line. That line was three days long. Three days long. And behind that line, that's where the Greek officials were. That's where UNHCR was. The organization that was in charge of taking care of these people were behind that line. And the only people who were helping, and this is the thing that was so shocking to me, were individual volunteers like myself who came and made it our business. And we were literally taking money out of the ATM because people, you know, little grocery stores don't even take credit cards. And we were buying groceries and buying carloads of food to bring to these people. They were out there for three days out in the cold with families and kids. 
And so I mentioned this, right? Like, like who are the people then who were helping if the large government agencies and large NGOs were not helping? Well, they were individual volunteers, and I want to highlight a few of them because these people are my heroes, and these people are the people that really inspired me to do what I do now. Um, gentleman up there, 60-something-year-old dude named Apostoli. Um, I call him my Greek father. He is one of the most fantastic human beings there is. Every single day, he hitches rides from other volunteers and from his neighbors, 45 minutes to drive over windy roads across this island. For nine months, six days of a week, Apostoli showed up at the makeshift camp to pass out whatever it is that he was able to pass out and to have boats come in. It's people like Ryan, who's this 25-year-old Malaysian kid at the time, and he saw that photo of Elon Kurdi, and he got Malaysian Airlines to give him a free ticket, and he just came over, and he showed up in the beach, and he saw that they had a burner, and he's like, I can cook. I'm going to make soup, and I'm going to make tea. So I ended up actually helping Ryan over there. And then it's people like these two Greek ladies who just showed up. You know, one afternoon, I didn't even get their names, but they started making sandwiches and they brought bread, right? And so, like, by day two, when all the crazy hysteria, when we had some quiet time, I asked Ryan, like, Ryan, thousands of people are coming every single day. Where are you getting the money to, to do this, to support all this? And Ryan whips out his Ziploc bag. And he had 190 euros in there. And I was like... And he's like, yeah, people just dropped by and they gave me this money so that I can do this. And he was so excited. And I was just standing there horrified, completely horrified, because this is one of the biggest humanitarian crises of our time. And the people, the only people responding to it are people like myself and people, other people responding by donating 20, 40 bucks. So Medj and I talked that night and we were doing posting giving our friends updates of what we were doing on Facebook anyway so we talked about the situation at this landing site and we asked for donations we went to sleep that night and the next day we woke up and we got three thousand dollars worth of pledges from our friends and our family and with that money we were able to help Ryan pay for gas that he was using to fire up his soup and, and uh, tea station for two months, we were able to get enough money out of the ATMs to buy three carloads of food, and we arranged with the fruit and the bread vendor to come and make deliveries. And that's really how it all started. I didn't go on this trip thinking that I would be fundraising and that I would run a charity. I actually went to see what was going on, and I got dragged into this because of the necessity of the situation. After coming home, it was really, really difficult to adjust. You can imagine, right? Um, going from seeing what I was seeing there to the Disneyland that is Silicon Valley and to the special Disneyland that is Facebook, right? Everything that you've heard about all the perks that we had, they are all true. You know, we had an arcade. We had free food. I got free laundry. And it was so hard for me to go from seeing what I saw of what's happening to going back to concentrate and, 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 and work. And so I didn't sleep very well during that time and I was up a lot and I was looking at Facebook and finding out what my friends were doing. And it was during that time that Adam Rosser, my co-founder of Sea of Solidarity, found me. He was on vacation with his dad on Lesbos who was um, a Greek professor. And he stumbled across this at the end of their vacation. So for two days, he was pulling in boats. You can imagine the trauma that that left him, right? So he had problems adjusting. So we basically supported each other through that process because nobody understood what we had seen and what we had gone through. And so we all talked about like, you know, we're here, we need to make our lives here, but we still want to be able to help in the front lines. What can we do? And the idea came up, I'm like, well, I was really good at fundraising. <laughs> And I told Adam about the $3,000 that we raised, and he's like, you know what, if we're going to do it, let's do it for real. And so he talked me into starting Sea of Solidarity. His wife came up with the name, if you're interested in the name, it's a really awesome name, because SOS is the short, and it also stands for, you know, ships under stress, right? And so um, we did that, and luckily for us, Adam is a lawyer at a large DC firm. 
And so he talked his uh, firm into providing us the, um, all the paperwork that would allow us to actually register as a 501c3 corporation. They walked us through what we needed to do to keep records and everything else. And the company did it pro bono. And that was something that I learned that since then, I've learned that there are so many people, especially law firms out there, that are willing to help people do things like this pro bono. So if this is something that you're interested in doing, definitely reach out, talk to people, because you would be surprised how many partners are out there and how many willing people are out there to help give you their services. So that kind of gets us to the point of how did we get involved and how I started Sea of Solidarity. The next piece, I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about how technology allows me to do what I do now, even from half a world away, working with a network of distributed volunteers, grassroots projects, as well as vendors. So I will talk through a bunch of different stories of how technology supports us in doing all these things. The first example is simply just raising awareness, right? So I talked a little bit earlier about that, that photo of Elon Curdy. When I was at Facebook, I actually did data analysis stuff, and so I worked with the team to figure out, well, how much interest did this you know, phenomenon galvanize in our um, community of people? And we found that within three days of that photo posting, 29 million people interacted with it worldwide. Billions actually saw that photo, but 29 million people interacted with it, real, um, uh, interacted with it online. Um, prior to that photo, only about 1,000 Facebook groups were out there um, focusing on refugee topics. Within three weeks of that photo circulating, there were 35,000 Facebook groups. And there were 8 million members inside those groups. Can you imagine those numbers, right? It's incredible, the response. And it really galvanized thousands of volunteers who showed up, like myself, to Greece and to Turkey, because we were starting to see more stories coming out of people we know. And personally, well, how did I end up in Lesbos? How did I even get hooked up in this? I just did a Facebook search, and I was looking for who was posting about this particular phenomenon, and how can I get connected? And I found this guy, who is Peter uh, Bouchard, and he is the head of Human Rights Watch. He writes articles. You can Google him, and you'll find all kinds of stuff on him. I just found his posts, and because Facebook is so easy with the whole click on and message this guy, I did it. So like, I totally cold called this person. I just said, hey, I'm Maria. I'm a former refugee. I want to go and help. How can I get connected with this? And he wrote back within minutes, minutes, and said, hey, Maria, really cool. My dad was a refugee, too. I'm so glad you're helping. And he gave me all the information that I need. So can you imagine that type of connectivity and being able to just get to people who can help you with this type of thing within minutes? We would have never been able to do that 10 years before without the technology help. And so we also use technology to help us organize relief efforts, right? And this example is very indicative of what we do and how we respond by donating goods and services to the people who are on the ground. And so those of you who use Facebook Messenger will recognize this user interface, right? It's a messenger thread. You bring in people and you talk. Well, how this happens is that I find out from a need, mostly from somebody messaging me or a Facebook post saying that, like, hey, we have a disaster, you know, we didn't get the right donations come in, and so we're out of shoes for men, out of shoes for women. Oh, by the way, we also need some sleeping bags and stuff like that, right? So they'll message me and see what we can do. And the cool thing is, because we've been there for so long, we work with a ne network of vendors there, we actually have a network of vendors that we work with. So ironically enough, the cheapest place that we can buy things on an island in Lesbos in the middle of the Aegean is at a Chinese store. Through a woman named Hui Xiao, who doesn't speak a lick of English and barely can say Calamara, which means good morning in Greek, okay? And so there I was, you know, trying to deal with this. And I have, like, you know, a picture of my mom standing on my shoulder saying, see, you should have paid more attention in that Chinese class. <laughs> but I didn't, right? And I can't turn back time. 
But luckily for us, Adam's wife, actually, she was also a refugee. And she ended up in Singapore, and Chinese was a mandatory language. So she learned Chinese, and she learned to write. So you get this thread, right, between me, Lon, and Aries, who runs a warehouse, oops, who runs a warehouse, um, who distributes donated goods and stuff. And we're going back and forth, you know, verifying with Aries what he wants, you know, talking to um, Hui, uh, Hui to see what his, her inventory is and what prices she would get us. She's in Lesbos, Lon is in Virginia, I'm here in Truckee, and Aries is in, you know, Lesbos. And with one messenger thread, we're able to organize release effort and get things to people when they need it. And these, this is an, a photo of two Swedish volunteers that we've met who were able and on the island and respond and say, hey, I can go and pick it up, you know? And so what is so mind-blowing to me is that even while I'm here in Truckee, with the language issue to boot, we are able to get relief to the people who need it on the beaches and in the camps of Lesbos, Greece, sometimes in the same day. Isn't that mind-blowing when, you know, even Amazon that we all like are so happy about that could deliver in two days? We're able to do all this stuff in the same day with our fast turnaround time. And that's what technology allows us to do. Um, next example, and, and perhaps the most impactful examples, or how we use technology to save lives. How many of you have like used your phone to mark your GPS location and sent it to people so they know that you're coming and you're, right? Yeah. Right, well, during the height of the crisis, what refugees and volunteers were doing, they were using WhatsApp channels so that you know, refugees were marking their spot and sharing their location with volunteers. So as they're going through and making that journey, they can give people updates about how people are doing, where they're coming in, so that volunteers can be ready if there's an emergency, if they need to dispatch rescue boats and things like that, which is pretty darn awesome. Now, while I wasn't on one of these channels, I am connected with a lot of people who are on these channels. And on February 11, 2016, and I remember this, it's, you know, it was like 8.50 at night and we're, you know, just chilling, Peter and me in our home. And I get this message with this GPS location on the messenger. And that message said, Maria, we need your help. There are 240 refugees hiding in this olive grove in Turkey. And there are 80 children within them. And the seas are rough. We can see the waves, it's dangerous. But the smugglers won't get their money until they put people on the boats. So the smugglers were forcing these people on the boat. And frantically, these refugees were writing to anybody that they can find who were involved with the refugee crisis to try to get help. So I'm sitting there going, holy crap, what do I do with this, right? And then I remembered an engineering manager that I work with, a guy named Birch at Facebook, is Turkish. So what do I do? I get on Messenger. I'm like, Birch. I was like, the seas are rough. There are 240 people forced by smugglers to get on boats. They don't want to go. Here's the map. Can you help? And he's like, what? <laughs> and after a couple of back and forth, he understood what I was asking him to do, which is, Birch, call whoever you need to call. Get somebody out there to rescue these people because somebody will die if they went on that boat. And so Birch did the thing that he needed to do and he called and you know by 919 he wrote me back, hey, reported it, here's the number for future references, da 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 da, signing out, right? I went to sleep that night so worried not knowing the fates of these people. And I was so happy that at 6 a.m. the next morning I got the message, everyone was safe, the police came and got them. So these people would rather have been arrested than to risk their lives, right? And that's pretty incredible because they get fined. And so I wrote Birch, you know, I'm like, hey Birch, we did our thing, it's good. These people are alive. And I just sat back and just took in the enormity of what we had just done. And the enormity of like, wow, what if we weren't there to pick up that, you know, message at that point? What would have happened to these people? Again, just incredible what fast turnarounds and a very connected world will let us do. The next incident is um, a story that Adam had. 
Adam actually was monitoring the systems because he was doing boat rescue, so he was periphery on the side helping. And before going to bed um, in Virginia that night of uh, January 9th, he got these three photos from a guy named Ahmed, who was a refugee who was already made it to Belgium, and he made the journey a few months before. But Ahmed, so Ahmed is safe, right, in Belgium. But Ahmed is monitoring all of these different channels to make sure that other people who were going through that same journey would make it safe. And it was his job to like call out for help and reach as far and wide as he could if something bad happened. And he found Adam. And he explained to Adam that there were 12 adults and six kids stranded on a small island that had a Greek military base while they were coming. And this was in the middle of the night in Greece, and it was in the high 30s at that time. And these kids were cold and they were hungry. Well, this group actually went to the military camp and asked for help, and they were turned away. When Adam called, because Adam worked on you know, boat rescue, he was connected to a Norwegian crew called Drop in the Ocean who did a lot of boat rescue. And he spoke to them and they were like, yes, we will be on it, we will talk to their Greek Coast Guards. What we found out later was that Ahmed already called the Greek Coast Guards and the Greek Coast Guards said no. And what actually took the Greek Coast Guards to get off their butts and actually go and save these people was international pressure. It took the Norwegians getting involved and calling them. And this is where I really learned the lesson of like, you know, if something is happening, nobody's there to hear it, or nobody thinks that they're being scrutinized, people don't feel the pressure all the time to like do what is right. And sometimes it needs that um, amount of, you know, people and pressure to really force people to do the right things. And those guys were saved. And so the major thing that I've learned throughout my whole time in doing all of this stuff is just you know connectivity right being able to have relationships with people and being connected with people can broaden the amount of impact that you can have and that you can bring to a situation every single story that i talked about earlier was really about how we brought together people how we connected with people to really make a difference in this world and that connection doesn't start or stop with the people that I'm working with afar. It actually extends. Mark, you remember this <laughs> dinner. <laughs> Mark was there last year. Um, anybody was here February last year when we had like eight inches of snow? I mean, water, rain. Oh my gosh, rain coming out of the sky, right? Um, it was like the worst time. Everybody's house was flooded. And yet we had like over 20 neighbors of ours who were interested in watching Bola Now 52 and uh, 4.1 Miles, wh which are documentaries. One is a documentary about the Vietnam refugees. The other one was a recent one that was nominated last year for the Oscars. And it's only like four or five minutes. So I would encourage you guys to watch 4.1 Miles if you're interested in finding out more about what happened. But we all showed up and it made me, encouraged me to talk to my neighbors about what I was doing. And in that talking of neighbor, to neighbors, um, I talked to somebody who had a daughter who was going to Forest Charter School. And so I was invited by Jessica Wilson to go and talk to the school. And the kids, you know, thought that that talk was so uh, meaningful, they invited me back for their commencement speech. And I was super honored from that. And then, you know, given that we are a small town, I recently got introduced to Andy Knox about two months ago. And he and some of his kids are actually sitting outside. Um, having pizza and uh, Andy teaches human rights up in Sugar Bowl Academy and he and his kids were already planning on going to Greece to volunteer this summer but they didn't know where to go they just had a great idea but you know and the passion but they didn't know what to do and so I actually talked to the kids met with Andy met with the kids and we hooked them up to go and help Ari's at the warehouse because every single day they're getting ginormous containers of stuff and they can use as many volunteers as they can to help sort things, put them in boxes so that they can be delivered all across the island and to people who need them. And so that's really cool. And that's really why I'm so happy that like, you know, the high school kids are here too and that you guys are passionate about this because I know that you guys are gonna make a difference if you guys get involved. And so, you know, during the introduction, you guys mentioned, like, well, what has, um, 
Tahoe Silicon Mountain done for you. And, and for us, it's been you know, really an incredible journey. I really think that like for me, I've just kind of you know, gotten into the Tahoe community. And it was only about two months ago that I got more involved and share my story and stuff. And one of the first things that we did was go to First Friday at 5. I got that name right. <laughs> And I talked about what I did, and I said, you know, I'm Maria, I live here full time, I work on passion projects, and one of my passion projects is this charity. And the main thing that I was looking for, and Ellen was there too, was um, I, I know a, a school for unaccompanied children. So these are children between usually the ages of 14 to 17 who traveled by themselves. Can you imagine making that journey without their family? And I had met some of these kids. And it was, you know, some of these kids come from the worst backgrounds that you've heard. And they're some of the most motivated kids. And there's a school for them now in Lesbos called Gecko Kids. And I wanted to put together a coding program for these kids because they were asking about it. These kids are yearning to learn. And so lo and behold, there's this guy named Ryan Desmond from Coding Nomads, and that's his whole job. He puts together curriculum, and he teaches coding, you know, four to six week periods at different places around the world. And I'm like, hey, how about going to Greece? How about doing some good for the world? And he's now involved, and I got them talking, which is fantastic. Again, great example of just that connectivity effect and what we can get out of it. And Connie, you guys heard Connie do her introduction with BitGive. When I heard about that, I'm like, yeah, there are so many people who have made a ton of money on Bitcoin. Why not have them do some good, right? So that's part one of it. You know, can we use BitGive to uh, to power some of our um, campaigns and fundraising in the future. But the other thing that I think is the most interesting and important to me is that you know when we did this. Because of what we saw with large organizations, just the opacity and not knowing where our money goes, right? Because when we showed up, there were no big organizations there. And I wonder, gee, where did my $1,500 go when I donated that to UNHCR earlier in the year, right? And so part of what we do at CF Solidarity is that whole transparency, right? We work with the vendors directly. We negotiate the price. We wire the money to the vendor. And then the volunteers pick things up. So then there is that check and balance, right? You don't have to worry about where your money goes. And I'm really looking forward to platforms like BitGive that can actually track, right, in a ledger format where things go. And I just broke that. And so <laughs> <laughs> that means my talk is over. <laughs> and I timed it really well because um, I want to thank you guys for having me here tonight. Yes, and it might not, but it's okay. This is, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm done now. Um, but thank you so much for giving me your time tonight and for hearing my story. If you want to reach out to me, you have any ideas, you want to connect or even give me a hug, all of those things are cool. Maria at csolidarity.org. Thank you. Oh, question. probably will have a few questions I suspect yeah. and we do have time so the one thing I'll ask everyone is and and remind everyone that if you do have a question you have to wait so we can pass the microphone to you okay so if I see any hands I will send one out to the first person that has a question I see do we have a question oh come on please don't be shy Jordan are we friends now <laughs> You're Are amazing. Now? <laughs> I don't have a question. I'm just saying you're amazing. Oh, thanks, Dan. <laughs> Jordan, you have a question. Uh, well, just a minute. <laughs> there you go. Good. Now I have to have a question. Um, we have to pick on the noob. <laughs> as, yeah, this is great. Um, what other tool? I mean, obviously, Facebook is a great tool. Um, but a lot of what allows distributed workforces now are just all the tools and things that connect people, sharing docs, right? What, for, for folks that are looking to do things like that, what other tools did you use, would you use, what, what do you need? We'd love to just hear your thoughts on that, yeah. kind of, especially since you're really dealing with a, a, global, a global team. Yeah, absolutely. So a um, bunch of tools that we used, and we really optimized on tools that were cheap, free or easy to use. So a couple of good things. If you guys are incorporated and have um, a charity organization, 
Google will let you use their entire productivity suite for free. So you see my Maria at cfsolidary.org. That's actually a Google email. So all the presentations and talks and stuff that I do, all of our documentation for our donations and all of that stuff is in Google Drive. Right? And we get all of that for free, whereas if you were to run you know, a regular for-profit organization, you wouldn't get that for free. So I would recommend doing that. Um, for other people who are looking at nonprofits and, and fundraising and things like that, be very, very careful about fees that are involved with platforms like GoFundMe. GoFundMe is awesome, I'm not here to trash them, but just know that 5.3% of your donations go to GoFundMe. And the credit card pieces of that really only cost GoFundMe 2%. That's why they have money, that's why they're there, right? And so for us, when we did this, we wanted to keep the cost as low as possible, right? And so we, um, we created our site on Square, you know, which is the easiest way to create our site. And Squarespace, sorry, not Square. Squarespace, which uses Stripe as their transaction engine. And we actually got into contact, and again, Network and connections. We had a friend who knew somebody way up there at um, Stripe. And we talked to them, and they allowed us to have $50,000 of donation, our first 50000 free with no cost. No transaction cost. That means Stripe was eating even the credit card transaction cost for that first $50,000 that was donated. And after that $50,000 was donated, they were only charging us credit card transaction costs. And that is still happening to this day, right? So, you know, the cool thing about this is, like I said earlier, there are a lot of organizations who are willing to help. Some may not know how to help, but finding the right people who have the right motivations in these organizations, having a conversation with them, letting them know what you're trying to do, oftentimes opens a lot of doors and takes down a lot of the costs and a lot of barriers for doing things. Um, any other questions? Please don't be shy. There's a question over there. I'll pass my yeah. mic just a sec. Thank you. Hey, Maria, thanks so much. Um, so for those of us that would like to help uh, your cause, maybe you can share what the room, like what, what do you think are the most effective ways? Thanks. I am not allowed to solicit donations um, <laughs> as part of this talk, but um, if you guys are interested in reaching out for whatever reasons, for connecting, for learning how you can help, just contact me. Um, and again, any way that you can think of, right, or saying, hey, by the way, I'm this. Like, so many people contact me out of the blue because they see my post and say, I'm a dance teacher. You think you can need a dance teacher there? I'm like, yes, we actually could use a dance teacher, and I know exactly where to put you, right? So just, you know, jot down, take a photo of my info and get in contact, because chances are if you have a skill and you have, you know, the, the capacity and compassion to help, we will find a good way for you to help. Any other questions? We have one in the corner. I'm going to run over here. Uh, first of all, thank you for your work and a very inspiring um, presentation. My question is, um, when you started it, obviously you walked into a little disaster. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who haven't kept up on the day-to-day -day plight, what, what is the state um, uh, of the crisis right now? Um, has it trickled? And then if it does um, become manageable, for lack of a better word, what, where do you see uh, Sea of Solidarity's vision? Is it, are you going to become a... Um, uh, going to refugee crisis across the world, or, or just where do you see your vision? Um, Craig, I had no vision when I started this. Seriously, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. And honestly, I did not think that I would be investing two and a half years of my life into doing this. When I responded, and that first you know, fundraiser, as well as when we first started the charity, we thought we were a stopgap situation. We thought people were coming, the governments and the large NGOs hasn't figured out how to respond, and at some point they will you know, pick up their responsibility and we would just be out of it, right? And unfortunately, that hasn't happened. In two and a half years, the current situation on Lesbos, and I will focus on that because I'm very connected to that and that's where we do all our work, most of our work, is that there are still 7,000 refugees who are living in camps. And most of those people are living in what I would call a summer tent on a wooden shipping pallet. And these are families living there. 
Greece and the EU and UNHCR have had three years to winterize, right, to keep these people warm and safe and stuff, and fed, and they haven't done it. And because they haven't done it, I can't do what I want to do when I moved up here, which is, you know, <laughs> goof off and ski more and stuff like that. Like, I still find that I'm doing this because the help is needed. Um, where is our vision? Ideally, really, really honestly, governments and large NGOs would take over and that people's lives would be better so that they don't need, like, because we're bandages. Like, I mean, seriously, we're so small. What we are doing is bandages in terms of how broad and big this problem is. But we do it because we know that, like, well, if we didn't send that $1,000 to Ari's every month to buy fuel so that he can make his deliveries, he's not making his 300, 400 deliveries every month, right? That means people aren't getting their goods. If we're not donating the $1,000, you know, so that one happy family can serve food, then, you know, one fewer person will be eating that hot meal. So we're doing that because we have to. Ideally, what I would like to see and do in this whole thing, and not just for myself, but for like the whole charity world, is that you know, large government agencies and NGOs take over and do what they're responsible for do with all the monies that they have. That's number one. Number two is I like to see platforms like you know, BitGive and other platforms take over this middleman responsibility that I'm doing. Because what I'm doing now, right, and I'm a trusted figure because you know, I've done it, I've seen it, I'm, I'm heading this, and I'm basically tying my reputation saying, hey, the projects that we've chosen are good projects, right? And that's why people donate to us. But I'd like to take myself out of this situation. I'd like for giving platforms to work as easily as wedding registries, right? So that schools like yours, like, you know, imagine how cool it would be. Truckee High School goes online and be able to say, you know what? We need all new soccer uniforms, you know? Or we need laptops to help fund this project. And you can register for it and then post that information out to Truckee, to other people who are spending time here. And then people can buy individual outfits or you know, school supplies and stuff like that through a platform. And they're buying it and they know that it's being delivered to you. right? Ideally, because I'm a technologist, that's how I want to see the world of giving go. Um, because this is super ineffective, you know? <laughs> really, it is. I mean, it is effective, but it is ineffective, right? It doesn't scale. Um, and so that's really where I want to see it. I, I don't want to get involved. I don't want there to be any problems. I don't want to save the world. <laughs> I don't want there to be problems to save the world from. We have time for just a couple more questions, I think. And we have two here. I'm going to no. just, you got that? Thank you. Um, so I had a question. When you were creating your nonprofit, if any, what hurdles did you face in the beginning? Um, <laughs> um, you know, so in some ways, on paper, it was pretty easy, right? Like, you know, we got sprinkled with pixie dust, and Adam is a lawyer, and they took care of all of the paperwork and stuff. But in so many ways, like, it was so hard because I've never done it before. Adam's never done it before. We had no idea what we were doing, right? Um, but we learned along the way, and we learned a bunch of really cool stuff that worked for us, right? And the things that work for us is really comes back to connecting with the right people and the right projects that you can trust, right? And that goes for the vendors that we work with so that we know, like, hey, this vendor, if they're saying that a backpack, right, is going to cost nine bucks, I believe that that backpack is going to cost nine bucks. And they believe that we will send them the money, even though the money won't clear for five days, they are going to release that backpack or that, you know, set of sleeping bags, right? So we learned a bunch of stuff of what helps us along the way. Um, it wasn't easy. It probably wasn't very um, elegant. But we made it happen, and like as scrappy as it is, like I said, we can get same day delivery faster than Amazon on an island in the middle of nowhere in the Mediterranean, right? So we just do what we need to do. It's scrappy, but we learn along the way. And that's really one of those things that I think, you know, every one of you guys probably have more resources and more connections than you kind of give yourself credit for. And that's kind of what I realized too. So if you're thinking about something, talk to people about it and you'd be surprised at how many learnings and how many things that people would volunteer and give you examples of and help you along the way too. Okay, so I'm going to cheat and ask two questions if I can. Um, 
one is, you know, the title of your talk was about running a global nonprofit from a mountain town. Yep. And so I was kind of curious about, you know, wh what, you know, do you have to be more creative because you're in a small community or is it better or, um, yeah. you know, like just from that perspective, the mountain town thing. And then my second question is, um, you know, if I have a passion and, a, you know, an idea for a nonprofit, but I need to still like feed myself, <laughs> you know, it, can you give some insight or, or hope as far as like making it a profitable business or, you know, or just, I mean, I guess nonprofit is a you know, yeah. misnomer. But making sure that you, you can survive. actually survive, yes, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll tackle the first one first, um, which is, you know, running a nonprofit from a mountain town. And um, it's one of those things where I think because of a lot of the things that we talked about, right, the technology and the ubiquity of how connected we all are, it makes doing anything like what I'm doing super easy. And for the people who are actually, you know, um, doing work here, especially those who are doing work remotely, you will know that there are lots of tools, especially where technology is at these days, that make it a lot easier. Now, you know, can I do this in a vacuum in a mountain town? Absolutely not, right? The fact that we are geographically close to the Bay Area helps a lot because, you know, quite frankly, most of the donors are still down there, right? And when I do fundraisers and give talks and stuff like that, most of the time I'm going down there. But that said, there were a lot of things about living in the mountain town, about supporting See, I'm going to kill this thing. You guys are not going to be able to deploy this and have me back ever again. Um, <laughs> but um, there are things about being in a mountain town that I personally didn't leverage until quite recently, right? And that is we are one of those places where really, really smart people want to live and choose to live. And because of that, there are so many resources and people that you can tap into that you may not even know of. So coming to an event like this and talking to people and just opening up, you'd be surprised how many people will raise their hand and say, well, I can help you with something, right? So that's that. Um, how to do this and make a living out of it, I don't have a good answer for you on that one. And the reason for it is that, you know, I, prior to doing this, I had worked 18 years in industry, in software, at a time when software and technology was very well rewarded. Um, you know, my husband and I have done well, and that has allowed and afforded us this particular environment where I can have the freedom to do things that I care a lot about and not worry about that piece of it. Now that said, there are nonprofits up here. There are people who fund nonprofits. And, and when you have a nonprofit and you're running it and that's your full-time job, people do understand that they need full-time staff for that. And I know that there are people who get paid you know, in the nonprofit sector. So I think that that is absolutely possible. Um, I just don't have any words of wisdom sharing from my experience. Okay, I think we have time for yep. one last question. Connie? Uh, I was just going to add, add a comment. So. I was just going to first of all say thank you so much. Like I've been dying to learn more about what you're up to, so this has been amazing. And um, being in the nonprofit world, I really, really appreciate all that you've been putting into this. Um, I did start my nonprofit without having like a whole lot of cushion. So if you want to talk a little more about that, um, there was definitely some fairy dust involved, but <laughs> um, it was kind of like done as like a scrappy startup. And now after five years, we are um, enjoying some funding, but it took a long time. But I, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Thanks everyone. I'd just like to thank Maria one more time. I think the talk tonight was very inspirational. I learned a ton. I now know what Sea of Solidarity <laughs> is, and I like the SOS acronym. That's pretty cool. So once again, it's Maria at Sea of Solidarity.org. Write that down for those of you on video. Make a note of it. Um, and I, I just think it was fantastic. And by, by the way, I think you were a really cute three-year-old. Had somebody seen that? I like to think that I'm a cute. Yeah, well, Something I mean, other I, if somebody seen that picture, you're, they might have started much sooner after all these years. Um, and uh, I, it shows you, I think, from my perspective at least, because I'm so immersed in business and working hard and all that, um, that each one of us can make a difference. Yeah. And it's pretty, that's the inspirational part for me, is, is that like every single normal person 
in this room can actually make a contribution, not just money, but as, as we say at church, what is it, time, talent, and treasure? And, and I think that that's true for a, a, an organization like this, and, and it's fantastic to see somebody who's making a difference. Um, it was very, uh, like I was paying attention. I think this is one of my favorite talks, I think, since I've been doing this. So thank you very much, Maria, once again. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Does somebody want to sponsor a new one of these for next time? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe some Josh. duct tape. The last thing I'd like to mention is uh, just the volunteers tonight. Thank you very much to uh, Rachel, Garrett, and Ellen for leading the way. Uh, to Josh, to uh, some new uh, volunteers. I think we had Carrie, Mark, and Connie. I'm not sure if I left anyone out, but I also... And, and well, Ryan and Dan. I always mention last. Corey and Dan. Oh, Corey and Dan, that's right. Corey. Rory, I always get it wrong, but thank you guys for uh, being here always and making sure that the, uh, the technology works without a hitch. So thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you in April. Cheers.